morning to all. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to Professor Rao and Cal University to invite me for this uh, conference. So I'll be talking about measuring deep tissue blood flow uh, using laser speckers. So I'll, I'll just talk about uh, one simple experiment that we have done. You can see on the on this side uh, there is a PDMS uh, in which I have engraved the word IIT and then I put a butter paper on the top of it. So when I shine the laser into this, then you can see the middle middle picture, this one, right? But when you do a magic, basically to compute a quantity called speckle contrast, you can see that it reveals the engraved word IIT, right? So essentially, what my job uh, is, uh, what is what is uh, termed as inverse problem. So trying to find out uh, what is inside in a hidden box, and the hidden box can be human body or it can be your luggage in airport. Right, or it can be a uh, approaching uh, fighter aircraft. Right, what we do in radar. Right, so it's a basically comes under the uh, uh, the theory called inverse problems. So here you can see a simple experiment on the law law, law side. This this uh, uh, bottom side, you can see a imaging of a mice brain. So what you have done is we remove the scal scalp and the skull and shine the laser and try, try to measure the scattered data using a camera and if you see the image from the camera it looks like this image uh, at the top which looks very noisy but the moment again you do this computation of the what is called the speckle contrast it starts revealing the perfusion map. So this is uh, basically uh, what is called the laser speckle contrast imaging which gives you the perfusion map in the uh, superficial region so it's, uh, it can give, get information roughly from one millimeter from the depth but then this is not very trivial you cannot just put the laser and get the data and then, then try to do these computations you have to adjust the camera parameters and the lasers in a such a way that you can actually start getting it so there is something called the sensitivity that means what exposure of the camera should i use what should be the aperture of the camera uh, what wavelength i should use all these things do matter uh, so, for example, what we use here is the wavelength, which is an air, an air region, near infrared region, which is roughly, roughly from 600 to 1100 nanometer. So, I'm sure you guys are exposed to what are called this air pulse oximeters post COVID, right? So, in pulse oximeter, we use the NAR region. We have a light, light emitting diode, uh, which emits the light in the NAR region, and there is a detector which detects it and try to find out the oxygen saturation. So, this is possible because of what is called a physiological window where the, there are so many absorbers or the chromophores in the tissue which basically absorbs the light uh, but in the NAR region two predominant chromophores are basically oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and that's exactly what we target here. So the idea is that we have to fine tune the camera and the laser parameters in such a way that we can start getting this type of images. So, but I told you that this is basically a uniform illumination. So I am actually il uniformly illuminating, illuminating the brain. But what, what if you want to look at the human brain? Because there is no meaning in getting the scalp information, right? So in order to do that, basically you have to focus the laser. So if you focus the laser diode to a point in the, say for example, in the forehead, then the photons will go deeper to the tissue and that can be collected at some distances away from the source. Now let's assume that the laser diode is perfect. It doesn't change, it doesn't drift, it's a, it emits constant intensity. Uh, let's assume experiment is done very well, there is no movement, nothing. Then if you plot the intensity measurement, intensity that you are getting from a, say for example, a detector which, is, which can be a photodiode or an avalanche photodiode which makes it more sensitive, then you can see you, you should expect an intensity versus time to be a constant because I am not changing my uh, intensity of the input laser, the experiments are done in a proper way. So why should my intensity changes with respect to time, you can see here, it's a very noisy pattern. So, that, so there, there was a time when people used to throw it away, saying that you just take an average and try to just do what is called the functional NIR spectroscopy, where people doesn't care about these noises. But then we have some people started using it and they found that this in fact you can extract the blood flow from this noisy data. So in order to do that, what you can do is to uh, basically you have to extract some parameters. This is a random so sort of a noise or, or maybe with some some uh, PDF. So you want to extract some information from it. So one option is you go for what is called it is a uniform illumination. You go for the speckle contrast 
and when you have deep tissue informations where you focus the laser and the, we are collecting the deep tissue photons then you go for what are called the diffuse correlation spectroscopy systems. Now the typical problem with this setup, so you can see here this setup, the main problem is this detectors that you need to look at these photons from uh, different distances from the source, uh, they are quite expensive. So for example, a single channel can cost you around 15 to 20 lakhs, single channel. Now you just imagine if you want the whole brain, uh, it's not easy to uh, build. So people want to use some high density detectors like a camera. So the question is, can you use a camera for DCS? The answer is yes, uh, but it's not trivial. The main issue is that if you want to do an autocorrelation of the order of few nanoseconds, uh, the frame rate has to be that larger, right? And whenever if you look at the high frame rate cameras, the readout noise associated with those cameras are very high, it's not useful. So it's not very trivial. So then we thought, okay, why don't we just use, instead of an autocorrelation for deep tissue blood flow imaging, why don't we just merge the two properties of these two imaging modalities, one is LSCI and one is a DCS. So in laser speckle, we used a uniform illumination and speckle contrast was a measurement. In DCS, we use uh, autocorrelation, but why don't we just use a focused laser as in DCS, but the measurement can be speckle contrast. So in that case, we can actually use a camera. We don't have to go for expensive detectors. We call it SCOS, Speckle Contrast Optical Spectroscopy. So this idea was invented in Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona, Spain. So I was also a part of that project. So then you can see that when the moment you use a camera, then the speckle contrast can be plotted as a function of several source detector separation. So the, the idea in this type of measurements is, you put a focused laser source to one part of your body, say forehead, and then take the measurements from different distances from the source. We call it source detector separations. So there is a theory, diffusion of light in tissue, which says that the further the dis, dis, uh, measurement that you make from the source, the deeper the photons that you collect. So that is called the spatially resolved measurements. So if you want to measure deep tissue, you have to put a detector which is further away from your source. So if you do that, you can plot your speckle contrast with respect to source detector separation and then start looking at some uh, uh, image. So once you have this speckle contrast with respect to different source detector separations, you can think about uh, quantifying the blood flow. Then we also can think about what is called optical tomography. That means instead of putting one source and the detector, you put multiple source or scan it and take more detector. Then you can actually start doing a tomography. You can see here there is a tube in a, in a block and then do a scanning in the reflection geometry and you can start reconstructing these tubes. So these theories I, I skip, but basically it comes from what is called the perturbation analysis. Now the question is, uh, so I told you about scores, uh, which is basically using a deep tissue blood flow imaging using speckle contrast, but at the same time there is DCS, although it's expensive, it's a gold standard. Now the question that you have asked is, which one is correct? So are they giving the same answer or the scores and the DCS? So we have answered it uh, basically uh, that it's it's not exact theoretically it is same but uh, for all practical reasons they are not the same. So we asked is it possible to recover the autocorrelation or the DCS data from the scores for which we uh, come up with the idea of what is called the MDCS or multi speckle DCS from IIT Bombay. So this, this particular methodology helped us to basically employ a camera for DCS which was the problem that I told earlier. Uh, so essentially this tells you, all this theory I'm skipping tells you that it is quite possible if you look at this equation, this particular equation, uh, suppose, let, let me put it in a simple way rather than this complicated stuff. Suppose I give you sum of 10 numbers and I ask you to tell, you tell uh, each number. So given sum of 10 numbers, you won't be able to find out what are each numbers. Of course you can tell but not a unique answer, right? But if you give a, if I give you a cumulative sum, say for example, sum of first two, sum of first three like that, then you will be able to recover it. So that is exactly what is being done here. So if you, if I give a single exposure data, you won't be able to recover the DCS measurements from scores. But if I give a multi exposure data because of this cumulative sum property, you will be able to recover. So this is what we have done and then we have done some uh, computations to recover this and then we validated in tissue equivalent fandoms, we did it in in vivo 
human hand cuff occlusion experiment so just cuff the hand look at put the probe in the hand and try to measure the blood flow and see whether it's getting perturbed so you can see in the pre cuff cuff and the post cuff occlusions and then we started using MDCF for cerebral blood flow measurements in adult human so what we do is basically to put uh, uh, illuminate the uh, forehead by delivering the light through for optical fibers and try to get the data uh, using optical fibers which can be used for standard DCS measurements and then you can use a camera here as shown for MDCS measurements and then we did a uh, two uh, tasks say for example one is voluntary apnea task where uh, you tell the subject to hold the breath and then try to see whether we are actually seeing the CBF measurements and then uh, we also told the subject to do a quantitative number processing task and see whether there is an associated CBF changes which we uh, found. Now the major problem that we always face from the community is uh, are you measuring from the scalp or the brain? So this is always people ask. Uh, in fact, uh, that is uh, uh, it's, it's a mix. So you, you, there are crosstalks from the scalp. It's not purely from the brain. But brain means basically what we are seeing is basically the surface cortical regions. So it's not a deep tissue in that sense. Uh, we can go deeper. We, it can penetrate scalp, the skull, and reaches the cortical region. That's all. It cannot go deeper brain region. Uh, I mean, with with the technology that we are right now. So then we, we thought, okay, let's do one thing. Let's do a filtering for the scalp so that this crosstalk can be avoided. So we came up with an idea about what, what is called the filtered Green's functions. And again, I'm skipping it. The idea is to do a Fourier uh, analysis or a Fourier uh, filtering method to remove the information from the scalp. And then we did some experiments in human brain and fandoms. And then we started getting some uh, data which is uh, filtered for the scalp uh, from the human brain. Uh, and we did a tomography as well. So you can look at all these uh, in our publications. Then we moved to uh, preclinical imaging, say for example, as uh, developing a small animal imaging platform. The, the, the idea is like this. If you look at this picture, uh, this is the setup that you have always have to build to do some experiments in animals. And it was becoming a big problem for us. First of all, we have to go to some other institute to do this. Our animal setup is uh, coming up. So right now we are doing it in Isar Pune. So it's a big task for the students to always go there and set up this stuff. And so all, all, there can be error in the instrumentation if you do it, don't do it properly. So we thought we should be build our own system. So this is a TV system that we have developed. It's, a, it's a very crude, not very pleasant to look. But we are now funded to make it more commercial by Barak. So, uh, so this uh, initial system design and proof of concept is done. Uh, now we are uh, trying to make it into more uh, maybe some, something like a first commercial prototype and we in fact did some uh, experiments we are now exploring the olfactory sensing uh, in mice using this setup. So uh, to coming, coming back to the uh, theme of this conference so uh, I do not do any machine learning as such. Uh, we just started, so it's like, like our baby steps towards application of ML. This is primarily one of my postdocs pushed me to do this. I have, I was having a lot of reservation against this AI ML stuff. Uh, many of the speakers were sharing the same thing. Uh, the main problem is this black box stuff. So whatever things that we do, we have our own code. We know what what sort of code we have to do, what sort of equations we have to solve. We know the convergence analysis of it. We know all this stuff. So it's in our hand. But this machine learning is a big problem because it, whatever the curves that you show here, it's like basically a five or ten lines of code, and the rest of the things are done by the library file. So I don't know much about it. So that's my uh, reluctance to start working on it. But nevertheless, we did something. So what we did is uh, enhancing the temporal resolution of laser spectral imaging system using data imputation. Uh, so basically, it's, uh, uh, the problem that we face is uh, shown here. So you can see that, uh, as I told you, uh, to, in order to use this uh, laser speckles to measure the flow, you have to put some uh, specifications of the camera that you have put, right? So you have to you, you have to have some uh, um, uh, measurement, uh, 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 like the, the, the camera exposure or the veil, and those, those things have to be set optimally to get the uh, flow. And one of the major thing is what exposure that you put. So this exposure time of the camera should be proportional to correlation decay of a particular blood flow. So that is shown here in this curve. 
but then the problem is just like any inverse problem we don't know exactly what you are going to measure so a priori we don't know what is it so we have to have a very high dense multi exposure data because we don't know what tau c we are going to look at tau c means uh, something proportional to flow so in that case uh, basically we have to go for a high dense multi exposure data which takes a lot of time so it affects the timber resolution of the system so the yeah, it takes a few few seconds to get the, all the data before we can move to the next one so it affects the timber resolution so we thought okay shall we apply machine learning for this purpose and then we started using what are called as generative adversarial imputation networks uh, which uh, uh, one of the speakers have already explained in a nice way uh, so the idea is something like this uh, what we do is basically to take the multi exposure speckle contrast data and then you give a training data which is by taking some just remove some of them randomly by, but our, my test data will be some, some row that means I am not going to take couple of multi exposure data say so for example if I want to do a measurement from say few uh, microseconds to few seconds I cannot just sweep the entire uh, exposure so I skip say I will take just 10 of them with some decade of change then then the question is with this with this uh, coarser data just like what I have given here with a coarser multi exposure data will you be able to do a measurement of blood flow with a good accuracy so that is possible if you take this coarser data impute that imputation means you just try to impute the uh, in include the data which are missing using this GAN network and then you can actually start doing it so we have some preliminary results so the idea is like this so you have the original data and this x denotes the missing one yeah, so you have this data matrix and then you have a random matrix which fills some some random numbers in the missed one and you have a mass matrix which tells you where the data is missing you generate a prob probability matrix like a hint matrix for the mass matrix you assign some probability for this missing one and the generator in the conventional way generate you the imputed matrix so it's just like a some some um, multi layer neural networks can generate this imputed matrix now now what happens is this imputed matrix uh, and this hint matrix are fed to the discriminator so the job of this discriminator is basically to say whether the imputed data doesn't look odd so you it should not discriminate between the actual data and the imputed data so if the discriminator assigns the probability in such a way that it can basically discriminate this imputed data then it's a problem so this output is fed back to the fed back in such a way that if discriminator find out this mask matrix with good probability then it means it, it, it couldn't discriminate so it has to be done again so this is the feedback loop that we use and keep doing it and it finally gives you some imputed metrics and then you can see that here on the right side you can see that uh, if I take say 10 exposures 10 exposures means uh, image is not just 10 10 exposure 10 sets of exposures with say 1000 images so it can be 10,000 images uh, and with the acquisition time of one minute then you your error in the blood flow index is 10 to 20 percent but if you give enough time so for example if you take number of exposures to be 30 of course the timber resolution is very bad because it takes three minutes to occur then your SNR is good 3 to 7 percent is accuracy that you have but then by deep learning we basically we can actually use 10 and then one minute itself at the with the same accuracy so we can actually save some time uh, improve the timber resolution but not at the cost of accuracy so we did this with the handcuff experiments as well now we, we very recently introduced what are called the stochastic differential equations to model the laser speckles uh, so this is basically a stochastic differential equations are basically like an uh, uh, first order ordinary differential equations you can see here this di by dt is 8 times dt you forget the second term b d w you take this a to uh, dt to the left side you can see di by dt is equal to some a so it's a first order simple first order differential equation but when you add something to it the so second term b times dw or dw is called basically called a w is a Wiener process d or we can call it as Brownian motion or you can consider this as a forcing function which is random in nature then you you can actually start getting some i, I of t which is random in nature but with certain statistics so for example i can fix the statistics of i to be exponential pdf that means exponential probability density function 
and with a given autocorrelation. Now, why we choose this is basically a speckle. Uh, what I told you regarding the speckle, that this random fluctuations, right? So, maybe I should have told this earlier. You take this pointer and put it into your wall. You can see very dark and bright spots. That is called speckles. That's what we have, we have been I have been telling this to measure the flow. So, these speckles are characterized by certain statistics, which is a given PDF, which is exponential in nature and a simple exponential autocorrelation. So, these are the two characteristics of these speckles. And in fact, you can actually start generating an IOPT using this particular model uh, with this predetermined uh, PDF and autocorrelation. Then you can use these equations to simulate the speckles. So this is for one of the first works in this field. Usually people use different diffraction theory or Fourier transform space methods to simulate the speckles. But we for the first time did it in using uh, stochastic differential equations. And uh, you can incorporate the deep tissue as well as the uh, superficial uh, speckles. And then these are some simulated examples where we have uh, simulated the speckles for su superficial regions. Uh, see, see, for example, you can take a actual image of the mice perfusion map and then merge it with the simulated uh, speckles. So it looks like this. So the question that you have asked is so so you can you can look at this publication to find more details. But then we thought, okay, if it is a simulation tool, why don't we make it into a hard hardware calibration fandom? So the main issue that we face for this type of uh, speckled imaging systems are we have to standardize it before you move to animals or humans. So you need some some way to standardize it. So uh, we use fandoms, which are basically this glycerol and uh, intralipid fandoms. So shelf life is very bad and uh, only discrete set of uh, the dynamics that you can get. But then we come up with a way to have a continuous uh, flow fandom where you don't, you don't have to worry about the shelf life. It's a complete uh, electronic hardware and it can be used anytime that you want. So what we did is a simple technique. We took this uh, simulated uh, random speckles that we have generated using our SD and put it into a piezo transducer. Then the piezo transducer will start vibrating. You illuminate it with a laser then the laser will fluctuate according to what we set it in the SD or the stochastic differential equation. Then we, we basically what you are generating is speckles which predetermined statistics using our equation. So we can have a, any, any value that you want to give, you can give it in the transducer, of course, limited by the bandwidth of the transducer. And then you can actually start look, using it for uh, speckle imaging calibration system. So this is what we have done. So now what you are doing is uh, basically approaching the stochastic inverse problems basically to do the stochastic optimization approach to do, to do this one. So essentially we came up with a model for stochastic models for the laser speckle. So now we are trying to see an inverse problem associated with this so that we can actually try to get a better estimate of blood flow rather, rather than doing some conventional deterministic fitting. So this part is where we are also trying to merge the uh, machine learning because right now we are doing some ordinary least coarse and maximum likelihood which is conventional methods uh, but only thing is that you have to basically uh, so uh, whatever things that you have done in ml uh, the paper is yet to come but we have put some effort to define why do you need machine learning because you can ask me why don't you just do fitting so this is something that you have to always think whether you need the machine learning or not so we have put some effort to uh, defend ourselves that this is required so here also we we hope we'll be doing it. So this this is a to publish. So I'm not including all these things in this talk because we are going to present it in Clio. So that's all. So these are my group collaborators and the funding source. Thanks. Long live India and France friendship.